make sure you come and support Dixon Place when this is all over, when theaters start opening up at the end of the summer. So um, we would love to see you in person. We'd love to see you at, as, at an Experiments and Disorders in person. And, and Mike, and, and this isn't, you know, I, 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 it, it, because of a, a lot of the events at Dixon Place are, are free or very, very cheap, but they do. we do ask for donations to support the programming. And so I'm gonna ask Mike, um, and by the way, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Rob, who are kind of helping us make this happen. Uh, they, they work at Dixon Place and they're, they're fantastic. And I'm, I'm hoping Mike can throw in a donation link in case people are inspired to, to, to make a donation this evening. Yes, don't worry if you can't. We know it's such a hard time. This is totally a free event. If you can, please exactly. do. That's all. Um, we usually also support and, and pay our writers with grants and also, but from the bar, it's a real way that Dixon um, makes money. So um, I don't drink anymore, but um, I have spent many, many nights at the Dixon bar in the past. <laughs> um, but I would say, make yourself comfortable right now. Like be comfortable, be happy, take a deep breath, get yourself a drink um, and really, uh, Welcome, 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 welcome to Experiments and Disorders. Now, Kristen, do you want to do the thing where we ask everyone to change their 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 names to just the letter A so that you can chat anonymously, you know, yeah. kind of like chat glory hole. So like yeah. you can say whatever you want, whoever you want, and no one knows who's saying it. So let's take a moment and everyone hit the three. You do it, Kristen. OK, so you hit the three dots in the upper right hand corner of your own of your own picture and um but and the artists maybe the artists shouldn't do it because no, the artists please don't it. do this because we need to know who to spotlight but everyone else <laughs> oh people are doing it look at all those a's showing up yay and so you just rename yourself a okay can be capital can be lowercase it doesn't matter and then we can use the chat you can ask questions to our readers maybe they'll answer at the end i don't know um you can chat up each other in the chat um i don't know the writing is so amazing and evocative and scary and sexy so um you know let us know how you're feeling so oh yes should we we're going to move on to our 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 our, our first artist um uh, max Steele, and max has a new zine which i've already purchased my copy it hasn't arrived yet but i just bought it the other day um a mike is going to throw in that link into the uh, chat so if you'd like to purchase a copy of the zine you certainly can and at this point we're going to spotlight both brontez and max um brontez and max are friends and um brontez would would like to would like to to introduce max so please uh, welcome Brontez Purnell and Max Steele. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you more about Brontez later when it's his time to read. Yes, we will. All right, can I, wait, can you hear me? Yes, we're, there you are, you're both ah! there. Okay, so I'm gonna start really formal and I'm gonna read your like actual bio so people know, and then I'm gonna pad it a little bit. But my homie over here, Max Steele, is a writer and artist in New York who makes text-based music and performance. He makes the zine Scorcher, Door Girls, and HP Magazine, and wrote the blog and hosted the reading series Fag City from 2006 to 2017. He, is, he was a resident artist at um, is a, uh, Brooklyn Artist Exchange and performed at the New Museum, Joe's Pubs, PPOW, Dixon Place, the Knitting Factory, La Mama, The Poetry Project, and the Queens Museum of Art. He is a junior prose editor at A Gathering of the Tribes, and his newest project is the poetry zine Epsilon, backed with Valance. So I've known Max for fucking ever. I remember back in the day, was it 2004? Were we kicking it in the dorms at Sarah Lawrence? Yeah, it was like the dorms at Sarah Lawrence were like smoking. Talk. I didn't go to Sarah Lawrence. I just hung out at the dorms. Um, and uh, yeah, Max was there. Um, Max is originally from Oakland. Um, and so we just like had a bunch of family through that. And I don't know, it's been really an honor over the years, just like watching his zines um, and stuff like that. I consider us like literary sisters, like through and through, like, 
Max's writing, I think, is so... I often say, like, she's, like, my real, like, riot brother contemporary, and it's it's always amazing to hear you and see you. I love you so much, like, with all my heart, and I'm going to let you get to it. Thank you, Brontez. I love you. I remember before I met Brontez in San Francisco, I was at a gravy train show, and Heather Chunks and uh, Hunks and the rest of the band were like, oh, Max, Brontez just move to town, he's gonna eat you alive. Wait until you meet Brontes, you guys are gonna really get along. Um, and they were right. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's, it's a thrill to be back at Dixon Place. I've gotten to perform here before and, um, and I love it. Uh, I'm gonna read one experiment and one disorder. Um, so this is a piece called Socrates. Once during college, I flew home for spring break, and on the flight, I watched a Sinead O'Connor concert movie and instantly became a fan. This would have been 2003, the farewell concert for her retirement, which lasted seven months. At home in the Bay Area, I saw my parents and my brother and my uncle Jim. Not a real uncle, but my dad's best friend from before I was born when we still lived in Los Angeles. He watched me and my little brother grow up. He was single and had no kids of his own. He gave me and my brother big gifts for our birthdays. Now that I was out at college, he'd send me money for books, $100 a semester, which went a long way. He would also send long handwritten letters in cursive, which I could not decipher. I only ever replied, uh, you know, thanks for the book money, school is great, studying hard, hate the weather in New York, XOXO, something generic. The same thing I would send to my grandmother when she would send me a birthday card with like $20. I just cashed the checks and bought cigarettes, candy, and cheap booze. That visit to California, I saw Uncle Jim as usual. He would drive up from LA and go drinking with my dad on St. Patrick's Day. Uncle Jim was an Irish Catholic. I didn't like that holiday. My mom said that she thought Uncle Jim was depressed. Both his parents had just died that year and he was all alone. I assumed that's what his long handwritten letters were about. That summer, um, or that visit, he was strangely sad and lingering when he said goodbye to me. When I got to school a few weeks later, he started sending typewritten letters and their message was clear. He wanted to come to New York to visit me to consummate the flirtatious relationship that we'd had for several years. I told my parents and my mom said I must have misunderstood that he probably just wanted to visit and she offered to make it a group trip so her and my dad would come along too. Uncle Jim sent another typewritten letter, furious, asking why on earth I'd blown the cover. Now my mom was going to come and ruin everything. He wanted to come a few days in advance and get a hotel room for us to be together. He wrote about watching me prance around my parents' house on my long, beautiful legs and where they led. I was 19 and I was out as queer, but this was different. I was totally a late bloomer and had never been hit on by an older guy, not really, and now had somehow been inadvertently leading Uncle Jim on for years. It fucked with my relationship with my parents. Uncle Jim insisted that I wanted to be with him and that my parents were getting in the way. When they confronted him, he told them that I signed my letters to him with X's and O's, which meant hugs and kisses, taking them literally as if to prove that I wanted him to fuck me. The next summer, I flew back to California and got a restraining order against Uncle Jim, but for a few years afterwards, he still kept driving eight hours up from LA every St. Patrick's Day to my parents' town, hoping to run into me it was awful and I like green, but now I only wear it 364 days a year. So this is the poem about Sinead O'Connor. Socrates, this is to mother you. Hey boys, it's noontime at the bus stop. Little village sunburn. Wake up shadow nail gel. I know cartoon backpack, transit metal, I get it. These are true duds. I never bothered piercing my ears or learning how to drive. There are lots of ways to ruin your life, and many of them involve television. This is my gallery. Didn't you know I work here? We're having an event tonight. I named it Socrates just because I like the way it sounds, but then by a happy coincidence, it turned out to mean little sawmill, or little sawyer, or little woodcutter, little carpenter. I will be queen of meteors. Let me give you some gay religion. In 1990, Jesus Christ said that she didn't want them to play the Star Spangled Banner before her concert, and so Frank Sinatra threatened to kick her ass. Jesus Christ's biggest hit was a song she didn't even write. Prince wrote that song. 
Jesus Christ performed on SNL and protested child abuse, went on TV and ripped up a picture of the Pope, said, fight the real enemy. She became a pariah. Everyone made fun of Jesus Christ. Jesus got booed off the stage at Madison Square Garden. Chris Christopherson told Jesus, don't let the bastards get you down. Jesus said, I'm not down, Chris. But when the crowd kept booing, Jesus told the band to stop playing. Jesus Christ became ordained as a nun. Jesus Christ came out as a lesbian for a time. Jesus Christ made a reggae That's album, nice. including their cover of Bob Marley's War. Jesus Christ wrote an open letter to Miley Cyrus, telling her not to send the <laughs> message that it's somehow cool to be prostituted. Max, for, for some reason, we can't hear you for, for one second. I'm not sure if you got muted. Hi, I think okay. I'm muted. You're back. Go, oh, back a few, go back a few sentences. Jesus Christ made a reggae album, including their cover of Bob Marley's War. Jesus Christ wrote an open letter to Miley Cyrus telling her not to send the message that it's somehow cool to be prostituted. Jesus said, it's so not cool, Miley. Jesus Christ went on a YouTube from a travel lodge and threatened suicide and then disappeared on her bike for two days in Chicago and became a cautionary tale. She just wanted her kids. Now who's the asshole? The singer Fiona Apple posted a video letter to Jesus and this is what it said. Hello, Jesus Christ. I'm Fiona Apple. I want you to know that you are my hero as well. And I just saw the video of you and I don't want you to feel like that. You've given so much and I wish I could be there. I wish I could be of some use to you. I just hope I'm your friend. That's all I wanna say and you're my hero. You know, I saw this cool punk girl on the bus doing a rosary with an ash cross on her forehead. When I sat down across from her, I saw that she was just untangling headphones and had a junky bruise on her face. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to read a shorter piece um, that is hopefully going to come out in the next issue of Bag School, my favorite zine in the world, which I hope you will hear more about later. Um, and this is called Sister. Standing at the corner, waiting for the light to change, something small flopped down beside me a dead pigeon in three parts, wings and feet connected by a spine picked clean. Everything else gone, no head and no guts. Gay friendship, unconsummated. We took turns being the meat and flame. Don't cut yourself, let me help. We wasted our youth and now we get to waste everyone else's. To be gay is suicide, is skin infection, is to die from touching. Queer bait aged out of orphanage. Now we don't have to listen to anyone. I know how this works. I hexed myself by not returning your love when I had the chance. I still haven't quit smoking. I still need the slow burn of siblinghood for once to not have to guess. I've already been overtouched. I wanted someone to have my back, to not take advantage of me, but you were my sister and I let you down. I got mad and destroyed the object of your affection. It seemed the lesser of two evils. You think I was chicken, but I just wanted to go to sleep. Haven't you ever seen an animal chew off its own leg? You realized that we would never fall in love together. We'd stay imaginary girls. It would remain a fantasy. We'd share the same frustration in unequal parts. We were the only witness to each other's pain. I have a big mouth. That's when you turned on me. You like a fight and I'm soft tissue. You tricked me and I fucked wrong for a year. You made me an altar boy. You did not push me, but you watched me jump. Good luck with your story though, I can't wait. Before we practiced our best lines on each other over sugar drinks in the kitchen waiting for our nails to dry, and nobody got paid. Thank you. 
Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Max. That was amazing. Oh, so, so great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. Our next uh, writer is um, Jackie S. And um, we have the cover of her book behind us here. Um, Daryl comes out in May. Um, I have a pre-copy, an advanced copy, and I'm like maybe a third of the way through it. And I told her earlier, I'm like, I love it. And I'm scared of the main character. Like, I, like I'm scared of him. Like it's, it's like I'm freaked out by this book because I'm freaked out by him. So um, I highly recommend and love being freaked out by books. Um, so um, the official bio is Jackie S is the author of Daryl that's coming out by Clash Books in May, 2021. She is a writer in several forms and under several heteronyms, unified for the moment. So far, her writing has appeared in The Vetch, The New Inquiry, The Zahir, We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics, Peach Mag, and of course, Twitter, uh, at Jackie underscore S, to name a few highlights. Daryl is her first novel, and you can check it out and pre-order it in the links that we will put in the chat. So I'm really, really excited to welcome Jackie to Experiments and Disorders. So please, let's give a welcome to Jackie X. Uh, hello. Um, well, I'm realizing that I kind of wrote that bio like a little bit too much, like I'm, I'm selling something, but I am. You, you should all pick up this book. Um, but maybe after you hear me read from it, you, you might feel different. Uh, it's called Experiments and Disorders, though. Uh, so I feel like I can kind of kind of get away with just just like whatever. Right. Um, so let me just give you a little frame for the, the book. Um, I, I like something I, I was just reading that, you know, John Berryman said about the dream songs. That he, he said that the poem, whatever its cast of characters, is essentially about an imaginary, imaginary character, not the poet, not me, named uh, Daryl Cook, uh, a white American in early middle age, sometimes in blackface. Uh, and in this book, he's a, uh, he's a, a guy in Oregon. Uh, in Eugene, who's involved in a cuckolding lifestyle, cuckolding, swinging, and so on. Uh, you understand getting a guy to come around, have sex with your wife while you watch. It's, it's how, how some people have a good time. Um, so he's uh, he's 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 a little bit uh, he's a little bit off to the side of queer exactly, but uh, you know it's uh, you know interesting things happen. Um, but let, let me let me try to tell it to you a different way. Uh, I, I'm just going to start this at the beginning. What time is it? It's eight fifty. Oh, forget, forget what, none of you are in my time zone. I'm in the Atlantic time zone. None of you, none of you live here, probably. Tell me in the chat if you're in Halifax that we should hang out. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's just jump in. Um, this is chapter one, uh, LeBron. You live vicariously through celebrities. I live vicariously through the guys who fuck my wife. Sure, okay, I'm the weird one. Let me ask you this. Do you watch sports at all? I could say like, what's the point if you aren't the one playing? But it's not exactly a fair question. I think a lot about LeBron James. So I can imagine his NBA ring on the bedside table next to Mindy's wedding ring and his little antique porcelain ashtrays that Mindy's mom gave us for our wedding. I bet he's got a great grip, big hands and move decisively. Touch with no tickle, no trepidation, no contingency plan. Just going exactly to the right place and going straight there. See, that's basketball. Sure, he's all around athletic, but for some reason, I specifically imagine his hands moving Mindy around, six foot eight. God. But look, I know as well as you do that that's just a fantasy. And even in a fantasy, I mean, I try to keep this stuff confined to people confirmed to be in the lifestyle, which I'm pretty sure he isn't. It's a little objectifying, you know? So I try to do right by people. He's a professional athlete, right? So he's focused on the game, focused on, I don't know, his own family probably, or his own problems, maybe just his own fun. I'm just saying that he's got a life. He isn't just there for me to look at. Just because a guy can fuck my wife doesn't mean that he wants to. That was a hard lesson for me to learn actually, but I'm glad I thought it through. Cause really, I don't wanna to project too much on the guy. It's bad enough that everybody wants to compare him to Michael Jordan. And by the way, I don't wanna start an argument about this stuff, but I do actually think he's better. You know what? Even if he isn't a better player, I like him better. Jordan always gave me the willies. All I'm saying is I'd never write a fan letter 
asking him to come meet us after a game, like, dear LeBron, I want to see your strong, perfect hands gripping my wife, pract palming practically her entire body. So it goes on from there. I want her to have your baby, love Daryl. I'd never write that. I'd write sincerely. Um, and so that's the first chapter. Um, and so Daryl, um, I'm trying to not talk too much about the plot, but uh, he has a therapist um, who's a, a ra rather dubious credential. And uh, he is, uh, he believes at this point that his therapist is, is British, although there's a bit of uh, confusion about that. Um, so here's the chapter, British. Couples therapy was really weird. It felt like Clive and Mindy, oh wait, I should have said, Mindy is his wife, I, I did mention that, but um, let me start that over. Couples therapy was really weird. It felt like Clive and Mindy were having a conversation I wasn't in on. He weirdly suggested that he'd like to watch me and Mindy have sex. He's kind of an alternative guy, or somatic was the word that he used. But it was hard for me. He made eye contact with Mindy the whole time, scribbled in his notebook and left. Is he even a real therapist? I guess I saw the diploma and Mindy says insurance is paying for it. She handles the money, I don't know. But still, how embarrassing. I don't see how it really fixes any of my problems. Maybe it doesn't have to, it's like a helping relationship, that's enough. Before leaving, he gave us both massages, which I thought was a nice touch, really strong hands. Is this how they do things in merry old England? I keep forgetting to ask where he's from. Mindy seemed to think he was great, so we'll do another session. But there's a moment I can't get out of my head from when we were having sex. Just as he was, just as I was about to come, Clive looked up from his notebook and shook his head at me, like I was doing something that I shouldn't be doing. What the hell? I'm not that bad at this. Why would he do that? I thought the whole point of therapist was to be non-judgmental. I read Carl Rogers in college. I remember this stuff. Therapy shouldn't just be a British guy who looks like my dad making fun of how I have sex. Frankly, I'm a little bit steamed, even though it's a little bit similar in a way to the coupling scenes we've done before. And now apparently, in spite of the sober thing, he wants to give us some drug that makes us more open-hearted. That'll be the third session. Okay, so, um, so there's a, a certain amount of couples therapy uh, that goes on uh, in this book. Um, now what, what did I want to do uh, for you here? I'm, um, so uh, everybody's, everybody's talking about politics right now, and, and uh, so why not? Um, I, I sort of worry that, right, so, so let me, um, uh, this is a chapter called LGBTC. It's my, my attempt to be political. There's a few attempts to be political. Daryl considers joining the DSA, all kinds of things happen. Uh, but LGBTC, can I just say how fucking weird it is for all of these people to be talking about cocks as a political thing when you really are one? A gay friend on one of my message boards said that this is what he felt like when Eminem was breaking out in the 90s. Everybody was saying faggot all the time. I can believe it. I'm sick of the slurs. See, I don't see my political views as being connected to the guys who fuck my wife. I'm a pluralist. Clive's a Republican, or really kind of the extreme right-wing fringe of that. Bill's a Democrat and really union guy first. Reasonable people can disagree about this stuff and they can do it in my bedroom. I was gonna say something like never apologize for being a beta, but apologizing is kind of what we do. It can't really be the slogan. I don't really see people like me as ever forming a pride identity like LGBT or whatever, LGBTC. But that sucks in a way. There's probably a lot of people like me. We just don't wanna shout it in the damn street. You know, is that self-hatred? I, I, I think it's just honesty. It reflects a difference of personality. We're never gonna be out there beating a drum. The alpha type, yeah, they got, they got more to be proud of. Maybe they could carry the lifestyle. I keep thinking they ought to have a union, but then there's too many guys like Clive for that. Well, whatever. Uh, like I said, I'm not a political guy. This is probably half big, but can you imagine if people started like identifying as hung? I can't, I can't stop laughing. Probably Uthun thinks you can do that, Uthun being his trans friend. I, I said to Uthun that I thought we couples are the only sexual orientation that's about the truth. Everybody else is concerned with performance or pleasure or recognition. And is that why people seem to hate us so much lately? Maybe watching and listening are sometimes the bravest thing a guy can do. Can you face your own inferiority? Can you watch yourself be replaced? See, I'm ready for aging. I'm ready for the technological future. Are you? I think Clive isn't. He's holding on to a past that can never come back. All these guys are. And it's very weird. You know, they see themselves as so strong, but as victims at the same time. And why is that? Like we're all supposed to mourn a world that's no longer ruled by strong men, but it still is. And if they're so strong, they ought to take it back themselves. 
So it's all pity for the pitiless. And then they become fascists. I don't want to ask Clive about this stuff because I think he really might be a Nazi or something. The only reason I think he's not is because he's mixed. Could an Indonesian guy be a fascist? I guess I should ask Clive what he knows about Suharto. Actually, I think I won't. Um, let's see. Um, just have to check the time. I've not read that chapter out. Um, so maybe we're getting a, a little bit of a feel of, of what he's up to. Um, of course, you know, Mindy, uh, his wife has, has her own life and, and she kind of um, finds her way into a sort of a lesbian relationship um, with a, a butch woman named, named Kit. And uh, I, I think I'll read that chapter. I want to see whether we can get, there's a, a scene I, 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 I told my partner I would read where people do uh, battle over the nature of time. Uh, but um, 904, wait, it's, I, I've been reading for nine minutes. All right, we're, we're just going to go fast. We're just going to see what happens. Just, just cut me off, you know, it just drag me out of the bar, whatever. You know, this is just tea, but you know, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you can do. All right, Kit, Kit, Kit. Uh, this is called Kit One. All right. I prefer hiking to rock climbing and cuckoldry to relationship anarchy. Is it just a generational thing? So your friend told me to join a dating site and it's full of these polyamory people. I can't stand it. That is not what I'm doing. What I ought to do is try to find more trans women like Uthu. No space in that word, by the way, in this book. I pay attention to them online and it seems like we've got some stuff in common or at least the stuff they joke about, sissy kind of stuff or something, but it feels awkward to jump into a conversation. There's this kind of standoff there. So also they all seem to be fucking each other and they don't take kindly to interest, even as they complain about no one loving them. It's a mess. Have you ever heard of a chaser? Yeah, see, apparently that's the name for a guy who likes them. You ever heard of a bigot? That's the name of a guy who doesn't. So uh, what can you do? How do I acknowledge that we're alike in a way without saying either that they're male or that I'm not? Gender is a fucking prison, man. Maybe I should get a rainbow hairdo and say that again louder. I mean, Mindy would kill me, but maybe not now because she's some kind of a dyke. I, I wish sometimes I was childish enough to really live in trans world, but I'm mostly okay with what I can pick up from a distance. Anyway, what's been going on with me? Not too much. You know, Mindy met a butch woman named Kit, and it's kind of a sweet but not at all charged dynamic for me. Kit just impresses me a lot. She's such a real person. Now, she cooked us breakfast the other day, and it was so solid and practical and perfect. None of my pretentious French sauces. This was hearty cast iron cooking. See, she's from the same Midwest working man stock as Bill. I was a little mad at her the other day because she used my towel after chopping wood. This is unforgivable, by the way. Uh, but then again, happy to have a cord of firewood split like that. And she just jumped in her truck and came back with towels and other stuff she needed to fix something with the engine. She's out there now under the truck messing with something. She might be changing the oil. I, I, I don't know. I didn't need a new towel. I was just going to wash it. But now we have more towels. Just a little thing that makes life better. So she also told me to stop watering our plants so often and the pompous grass already looks better. Kid is full of that kind of advice and she always follows through. I'm glad Mindy's happy and amazing to get to know someone like Kit. I mean, normally, how would I ever? It's bad enough that I'm a man, but in another way, I'm not enough of one. It doesn't, it just doesn't feel like cuckolding in the way that's hot for me. It's like a complicated relationship. Kit asked me about my feelings and surprisingly shared hers. Under the gruff exterior, she really gets people and she's so human, again, real. And I'm gonna actually break off this chapter even though I, I'm really having a good time here, but I, I really wanted to get to this chapter because I told, Told somebody that I would read it. Um, so this this chapter uh, introduces a, a young hippie guy named Moonbeam, and uh, Moonbeam is uh, he's actually he actually recently migrated to Eugene from the Bay Area, and I, I have a book that's kind of his backstory um, that I'm working on right now. I was thinking of reading a little bit from it. Uh, no time for that. Um, but let's, let's, let's meet Moonbeam and uh, we'll see just how much time we have. This is a longer chapter. Um, and oh wait, uh, context, context, the problem with writing things with plot, I used to be a poet. You could just say whatever the fuck you want, but now I've got to tell you who these people are. Daryl has met this woman, Satori, um, and she is uh, the proprietress of a local uh, tattoo parlor and yoga studio, and they're really connecting, and he is maximally laying the goddess trip on her. I mean, he does not know who this woman is, um, but they, it's, they have a good connection, but, uh, you know, like everyone, you know, she has other lovers, uh, younger ones. Um, anyway, so uh, here we go, Moonbeam. I had tea 
because of course it would be tea. It is tea with Satori and Moonbeam. I want to die. There's just a way of moving that these yoga guys have. I, I just hate it. I don't know what makes it different than Satori's way of moving, her presence, but it is. Why does he breathe so slowly? It's like he has to wear his progress in meditation all the time, like peacock feathers. I thought the whole point of meditation was that it wasn't about that. But then here we are, another thing for me to be worse at. This is bad enough that I'm older, that I'm in worse shape. He probably has a better dick than me. I don't want to think about that. I don't know why it was so easy to cope with all those other guys when it was Mindy, even in the first stages of our lifestyle exploration. I think the difference is I'm over it. I really am just over being a cuck, but now here comes Moonbeam, the punishing reminder that being a cuck isn't a matter of an enlightened lifestyle at all. It was never a choice. It was never a kink. It was just a fact. It's a fact about nature and it's confirmed in the heart. He's the better man, so he'll take my woman. They always do. What I feel for Satori is so pure and I haven't felt that before. So it's a different kind of love. I think I get better and better at falling in love in my life. There was Mindy and then Bill and now Satori. And I do feel very modern in one way. I feel like I can love them all, I really do. I'm full of warm feelings for Uthun, for Patrick, even for Clive, why not? But just now when I finally have something like a normal sexual connection with Satori, I can see it already. She's gonna leave me and that'll be it. I mean, that's her prerogative. She'll pick up her ball and go home. She'll find someone more fun to play with. I don't know what I'll do. I reached for the teapot and they both laughed. I guess at the idea that I'd be so impatient, direct, impolite, un-Japanese. Hold on, Daryl, we've got time. Moonbeam poured me a cup in what looked like slow motion from a great height and painted a Japanese character on a scroll. Calligraphy, he said, in a very satisfied way. I almost laughed. Like, of course it's calligraphy. That's literally the fucking word for the thing that you're doing right now. I mean, do you have anything to say about it? I think Moonbeam never has anything to say about anything, but he has this way of speaking that clearly conveys at least that he thinks he did, that he's communicated something that's so deep and we're all supposed to appreciate it. We're all supposed to just play along. And now I have to, I can't say how annoyed I am because I have to convince Satori that I'm on the level, that I'm a spiritual guy too, or unless they're testing me, are they testing me? When I finally took a sip of the tea, and seemed to drain the tiny cup much too fast. Moonbeam poured me another, this time from even higher, and drew another character definitely different than the first one. That made me wonder if he even knew what he was writing. It's not like we'd know, maybe they're just squiggles. I, I looked in the middle distance, he looked into the middle distance and asked, Daryl, you seem to be a man who thinks. What do you think about the nature of time and the moment called now? Do we have any time? I mean, speaking of which, like somebody tell me, do we have time to, to, to I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, somebody yell at me, okay? Go ahead for, yeah, go ahead for a couple minutes. Okay, all right. Um, what a question. How can anyone think anything about time? It's so abstract and confusing, but these people romanticize it. I, they like the confusion. I tried to say something too literal, that subjective time is sort of false and what appears to be a sequence of moments, isn't that at all? I said, when we think we're being, we're really remembering and what gets called experience is something assembled in retrospect and there are no true moments. Satori and Moonbeam both stared at me for a while and Satori asked if I really thought that, that there is no moment. The look in her eyes was sort of sad, like the way Christians look at you when they realize you're not just another prodigal son that you actually don't believe in their guy and you're gonna go to hell for that reason. I wondered if I wasn't missing something, I don't know. Like I was supposed to say, be here now. That's the magic phrase, right? But I was frustrated and I said, yes, I wasn't taken in by this new age cult of immediacy and presence. And when I tried to explain what I've been talking about, and then I tried to explain what I've been talking about with Uthun, that spiritual people just seem to pri be privileging a special layer of experience, the one that feels primordial. You know, it, it, it looks like what's given, what's under, what's before, but it's just a part, it's just the bottom part. Does that make any sense at all? Satori and Moonbeam seemed very sure that it didn't. Satori actually seemed hurt and Moonbeam seemed amused. Well, that's two strikes. I mean, Moonbeam said he thought that there is such a thing as a now, and he could prove it to me right here. As horrifying as that sounded to me, it was a very aggressive thing for him to say, a bit out of his usual mode, which made me feel a little smug, just knowing that he's on his back foot like that. So I agreed. He asked me to sit cross-legged, and when I told him I'd be too uncomfortable, he offered that I could sit on my knees. He supplied a cushion, and down to the floor I went. He said, we ought to breathe together. 
and began to outline a spiritual exercise. I don't like this kind of thing. I especially don't like how he had me off guard. Not, not only did he know everything that was gonna happen, doing anything besides following his orders always seems to mean not being fun enough or not spiritual enough or not present enough or not saying a clear enough yes to life and to the moment and to everything else. Why do I have to do everything Moonbeam tells me? You just put it in my mouth, you hippie bastard. Why can't I just blow you? But now you have to humiliate me like this. And I had to stay focused as he explained the exercise. So um, what follows is a kind of a meditation scene and uh, maybe um, we, we can all catch up later because I think I've been reading for a long time. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Wait, you're muted, Tom, you're muted. My goodness, thank you so much, Jackie. That was amazing. I loved your reading. I can't wait to read your book. Um, your cop, the copy is on its way to me in the mail. And um, I just loved having that sampler from it. Thank you so much for, for reading with us tonight. Um, and um, yeah, and I feel a little weird because I'm like, it's so funny. People are gonna think that I'm such a weirdo for th being disturbed by it, but she's not reading the like, some of the dark stuff that got me. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I want to take this moment to say thank you to Jackie, and we are going to introduce our next reader, um, whose book uh, we have behind us, the book cover here, Detransition Baby. So, Tori Peters is the author of the novel Detransition Baby, published by One World Random House, as well as the novellas Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones and The Massacre which I read when they came out and loved. Um, she also holds an MFA from the writing program at the University of Iowa and a master's in comparative literature from Dartmouth. Tori rides a pink motorcycle and splits her time between Brooklyn and an off-grid cabin, off cabin in Vermont. So jealous. For the past few years, Tori has been part of a trans literary movement based on trans people sharing their work among each other without barriers. And then she got a book deal with a big five publisher. The, um, and now she's nominated for the Women's Prize in Fiction and is going to be executive producing a dramedy TV series based on this book, Detransition Baby, which I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, I want all of your works turned into TV series. Um, so please welcome Tori Peters. Hi. Um, so, um, can you hear everyone? I'm not muted. I've like forgotten that I always have to unmute. Um, so I've been, uh, this is a book. I've been promoting it now for a couple of months. And um, if it's really hard to keep reading the same sections over and over and the parts that I like to read, I feel like many people in the audience have been at other readings where I've done those sections. Uh, so I thought since it's experiments and disorders, I'd read from a short story that I wrote um, at the beginning of the COVID quarantine. And that's a little bit different than the books. So um, it's called The Chaser and it's, uh, Basically the perspective, it's from the perspective, it takes place at high school and it's from the perspective of uh, a, a high school boy who has a relationship with somebody who m may or may not be like a pre-transition trans woman. Um, that's pretty much all you need to know. The reason that Robbie had a slight odor like leaves decaying in the fall is that he didn't shower. He didn't shower because the boys dorm only had a gang shower, a beige tile room with four shower heads poking out from the wall. Robbie hated getting naked in front of the other boys for anyone to see his chubby feminine body and his tiny cock. I didn't like the gang shower either when I first got there. It seemed like some weird holdover from the 1950s, something that should have been modernized after the sex, sex panics that society had gone through when it realized that boys could be molested too. But nope, the Quakers never got the memo, probably thought it builds character. 
Back in the suburbs, my friends would have called our shower room super gay. All of us soaping up in front of each other, but that's not how things were at boarding school. The homo thing was to be afraid of looking at each other's bodies. The hetero thing was to just dangle your dick out while talking to each other, acting like you couldn't care less about the other dicks pointing back at you. And then even to outman each other, we would just be naked all the time. This one kid, Kyle, he took the shower head off the pipe so the water came out in a hard stream like from a fire hose and he'd wash his asshole in front of us with the same chill that he brushed his teeth. We all started doing it. We called it the power shower. If you wanted to show that you aren't homo, just get that power shower up your ass in front of the other dudes. It was this weird posturing and it was effective. I respected Kyle. He worked out, he listened to hip hop and he washed his ass with the equivalent of a pressure washer like it was no big deal. Weird flex, but still impressive flex. Still, there was, a, sorry, there was this one toilet stall that had, a, that had a door. It was suspect if you took a shit in that stall. If a kid was in there, the other kids wouldn't let him shit in peace. What are you hiding, bro? You jerking off in there? We had this one, we had this one toilet by the window. Some kids destroyed the entire stall around it. And to punish us, the head of the boys' dorm refused to fix it. We called that toilet the throne because while sat upon it, you could hold court, surveying the entire dominion of the bathroom while you shat. And not only did it occupy the position of prominence within the bathroom, it was right next to the window. So to show off, you could lean out and call out to any girls that were in the square as you plop plopped in the water. That was the alpha move, the confidence to shit like you weren't shitting at all. Anyway, I got placed with Robbie as my roommate the fall semester of my junior year. He would ditch class so he could shower when no one else would be around. So I'm gonna time this, sorry, no long. Uh, he would ditch class so he could shower when no one else would be around. He'd get detention, but the trade-off was worth it to him for the occasional shower in peace. Early on, I tried to explain to him that if he didn't want anyone to think he was a fag, he just had to not care what we thought about his body. But of course, he didn't necessarily want us to think he wasn't a fag. Not only did he care what the boys thought about his body, some part of him wanted boys to notice his body, even if he couldn't bring himself to say that. That's how it is too for, for girls too, I think. They want us to notice their bodies, to obsess about their bodies. And that's why they can't show them to us. A power washer up the ass might ruin the allure. Robbie and I started hooking up in our last month together as roommates. There had been a strange tension between us for a month before that. I had largely ignored him for our first months together. He had two modes, shy and nervous or embarrassingly exuberant. The latter I noticed I mostly observed during the day from a distance when he'd sit with the girls and they'd get going. I'd look over and there he'd be, the kid who'd barely raise his voice over a whisper in the dorm shrinking, oh my God, she did not, and gesticulating wildly. Girls, especially this one clique of senior girls really liked Robbie. That was one reason why no one ever outright bullied him. You didn't want those girls to think you were an asshole, but it wasn't like you'd score with the girls by being nice to Robbie either. About two and a half months into the semester, he and I got into the habit of quietly talking after lights out. Him on the upper bunk, upper bunk and me below, telling each other about our families or else he'd share the gossip from the girls' dorm. He had a pretty good window on the girls, one that I for sure didn't have. I found out that he secretly smoked. He had half a carton of smokes hidden in a coffee can out in the weeds near the soccer field, which seemed rebellious for him. One night we opened the dorm window, helped each other out and shared some smokes out in the field. How come I spent every night sleeping within a couple of feet of you, I asked him when we were sitting out in the field under a bright moon and I never smelled cigarettes. He smiled in his shy way with his dimples and soft cheeks. I have perfect grooming, he said. I couldn't tell in the way he meant it, if he was joking or not, given his thing about the shower or what to make of a slight edge of flirtation the way it invited me to notice the care he took with his body. Actually, he did have a lot of hair care products and stuff for his skin, and once or twice, he wore eyeliner. I didn't have any products. Boys in the dorm gave each other to know that products were a sign of weakness. Every boy on the soccer team, including me, washed his hair with bar soap. Obviously, bar soap fucked my hair right up. I was self-conscious about how frizzy it was. The strong thing to have done would have been just use conditioner and not cared what that meant about me, but that wasn't something I could do. The problem wasn't that my hair was bad. The problem is that I was vain enough to care that it was bad, which pointed to a failure inside of me. Using conditioner would have fed a vanity. Give it a little and pretty soon I'm primping every time I walk out a door. As a compromise, 
I wore a hat a lot, the brim over my eyes to sort of flatten out my hair and ease the frizz. Before lights out one night, I was looking in the mirror, trying to ruffle my hair after a day of hat heads so tight that the roots of my hair hurt when anything stirred them. I didn't realize Robbie was watching me, but then he said softly, you have such nice hair. If you just took care of it, you're lucky to have hair like that. I turned to say something biting, but I caught myself. He sat on the bed in a pair of loose cotton pants and a t-shirt, and in the yellow light of his bed lamp, I noticed, not for the first time, that he was sort of pretty, in the way that fat girls are pretty, all chubby cheeks and doe eyes and soft, clear skin like women in old paintings. The urge to snap at him fell away. He got up and opened a box on a shelf and pulled out a small plastic tub. A hair mask, he said, and handed it to me. Then for one of the first times, he talk, started talking to me in that exuberant way that I'd seen him talk with girls. He told me, his hands fluttering, that if I really wanted to heal my hair and if I didn't want to buy products, the best thing to do would be to make my own hair mask with avocado, honey, olive oil, and eggs, to put it in my hair for an hour, then wash it out because my hair needed to be able to hold moisture again. You need as many humectants as you can get, he said. I stared at him. But rather than wilt under my look, he reached out, held my wrist with his fingers and said, oh, come on, I'll do it for you. He led me to his bed and I was suddenly very turned on. I let him direct me to sit cross-legged on the floor between, between his legs facing away from him while he massaged the hair mask into my scalp with lubricated and thorough fingers that slicked through my hair. It was like they woke up all the nerves in my head just to soothe them. From between his soft thighs, I wondered what to do about my hard cock. Three nights later, I stopped trying to be discreet when I jerked off at night. I was relieved that Robbie didn't try and sleep in my bed our first time. After I came, he watched me as I breathed heavily for a few moments until in the rush of post-orgasm regret, I shifted a little to minimize how much of his torso pressed against mine. Before I came, I had liked the feel of his softness against me, had wanted his torso against mine, even though we didn't wrap our arms around each other nothing like the intimacy of him an embrace. Instead, I lay on my back, arms stiff on my sides, and he lay, at, he lay on his side, one arm beneath him, the other on my cock, and just a little bit of his soft stomach overhung and rested on my ribs as he leaned over me, the contact of our skin warm. After I came, he moved gingerly away, out of my bed, holding one hand in the air, the hand with my cum on it, so as not to get any on my comforter. He climbed back up into his own bunk, and I think he must have wiped off my cum on his own sheets. Without talking, we both fell asleep. The next night, long after lights out, I could feel his wakefulness in the bunk above me. He tried to keep still, but I could sense his listening in the cautious, sneaky way he tried to find a comfortable position without making the bed squeak, like he was some kind of bed ninja. In the distance, an occasional car hissed along the west at wet asphalt on the road beyond the school fence but otherwise he and I listened to each other not sleep. It started to annoy me. Also, I got a boner again. Finally, I said, I can't sleep. And he was silent. And for a period, I thought maybe I'd been wrong, that he had been asleep this whole time. And it was only I who had projected my anxiety about the night before onto the dark hours. When he spoke, there was no trace of sleep in his voice. He had been considering what to do. Me neither, he said. I've just been awake thinking. I was afraid that he might want to talk about the night before. That's not what I wanted. That was the last thing I wanted. I want help sleeping again, I said, to avoid the chance for him to suggest anything else. He didn't move or speak. I had a sudden stab of fear that he might reject me. I almost got angry about it, angry thinking about it, even in those brief seconds, what I would have to do if he rejected me, how much I could deny, and how much I would have to protect myself. Okay, he said. From above me, his legs appeared as he climbed down from the bunk. That became our code. I'm sorry, just seeing how much time. That became our code. Sometimes I would say it, I can't sleep. Sometimes he would ask, are you having trouble sleeping? The answer was always yes. Then he would slip down into my bunk. Once he told me he'd heard that of all the professions, bakers have to know the most tricks to fall asleep because they have to get up at 4 a.m. to start their bread and they have to go to sleep just as it gets dark. The baker's trick, Robbie said, was to smoke half a cigarette, jerk off, smoke the other half of the cigarette, then get immediately between the sheets. The bakers would pass right the fuck out. We made up our own baker's trick. We snuck out the windows, out to the soccer fields where he stashed his cigarettes. 
We shared a cigarette as he blew me in the trees. I handed it down to him as he sucked. He took breaks to puff, then passed it back to me and went back at it. Afterwards, we each smoked a whole cigarette, then climbed back inside. I slept like a baker. Towards the end of the semester, I tried to touch him for the first time. He put his hand gently on mine, mine and moved it away. At first, I thought he moved my hand because, of how, because he was ashamed of how small he was. I'd seen him naked by then, although he was usually careful about it. Even our, in our room, he would change behind a towel. I tried to touch him again to let him know it was okay, that I didn't care how small he was or about anything else. But again, he moved my hand. This time, the shame was mine, a rejection. It had the same emotional tone as when a girl back home shifted away when we were making out at a party after I tried to slip my hand into the front of her pants. She gave a careful smile and a quick shake of her head, whispering, not yet, which we both knew was a no phrase to spare my feelings. And then she kissed me more aggressively to make up for it. I didn't know what to, what to do with Robbie reacting like a girl. The whole reason I touched him was to not make him feel, not make him be the girl. I started feeling bad that he always had to be the girl. I tried to touch him out of guilt, to show him that I even cared, to toss him, toss him a coin to whatever masculinity I'd been taking from him. After he moved my hand again, I turned from him. I wanted to complain that twice when I tried to touch his dick, he said no, but he touched my dick all the time. I didn't, want to, I didn't even really want to touch his dick, but it bothered me to be told no, like I was the cock desperate fag who deserved rejection. Beside me, he drew up the sheets as if cold. Then he traced two fingers along my side, dragging them along the edges of my obliques. I knew that he admired my torso. The food at school wasn't that great, and I spent a couple hours most days running on the soccer field. I had abs all over. I don't need to touch you, I said, careful to drain all the warmth from my voice. I just thought that maybe you don't always want to be the girl. I meant it to insult him, to let him know that being squeamish about touching me was girly. Weirdly, he laughed, too loud in the night. We had a middle room in the hall. With that loud laugh, any other kids in nearby rooms could hear us. I made a face and pulled back from him. Usually, if I was even a little bit skittish, he went quiet, but this time he spoke with confidence. Trust me, he said. Suddenly we were on his turf conversationally. I always want to be the girl. Fine, I said. Works for me better anyway. It did work for me. Some part of me liked that he wore those cotton sleep pants. I liked the way he had all those hair products and skin products lined up just like girls did. And when he got into bed with me, I came to like his smell, that unshowered funk mixed with the light perfumes of his shampoos and lotion. See how much time. Um, I'll read one more little section of this. Uh, about a week before Christmas, I went to do my laundry. In the laundry room, some girl had left a green satin nightie on top of one of the dryers. At first, I didn't even care. I barely noticed it, except to pick it up to move it from the dryer I wanted. All of a sudden, with the softness of the fabric between my fingers, I wanted Robbie to wear it for me. But that seemed too fucked up, stealing some girl's nightie for a boy to wear for me. I set it back down on the dryer and left. All afternoon, I thought about Robbie, how his plump thighs would look with the lace edge of the nightie falling just below his ass. My bell rang. I went back to the laundry room. Everyone would be lining up in the dining hall. I'd have the room to myself. The nightie was still there. I picked it up and held it up, trying to imagine whether or not it'd fit Robbie. Right then, the outer door of the laundry room creaked open. I turned away from the door and stuffed the nightie down the front of my pants, letting my hoodie fall over the belt line just as the inner door opened and my teacher, Mr. Russell, walked in carrying his laundry basket, laundry in a plastic basket. Usually the teachers didn't use the student laundry room. I've been so focused on what it meant to steal a girl's nighty, the social weirdness of that, that it hadn't occurred to me that I could get in official trouble. Why aren't you at dinner, Ms. asked Mr. Russell. He sent a searching glance around the room as though he expected to find lines of coke and, uh, cut and half blown on the laundry folding table. He didn't like me and I didn't like him. He was only 29 years old, but looked like an aging hippie, bearded and balding with the thin remaining strands pulled back into a gross ponytail. He had a PhD in American history, but been unable to finish his dissertation, had washed up to teach at our boarding school. His bitterness showed in the pleasure and effort he took to catch boys in situations where he could demand discipline. Doing my laundry, I told him, as if it was obvious. Then I realized none of the machines were going. Yeah, he asked, where's your laundry? I thought quickly. 
I wanted to make sure all the machines were full before I lugged it over. He gave me a weird look. I decided to turn the tables on him. Why are you doing your laundry in the student laundry anyway? Can't help surrounding yourself with boys' dirty underwear? His eyes bulged and he took a breath. My boarding school, one of the earliest Quaker schools in the West, attracted teachers of two types, either soft-hearted idealists or mini tyrants. The best way to deal with the mini tyrants was to make sure their tyranny was costly enough that small battles weren't, just weren't worth it. Insulting a teacher constituted a major rules offense, but I doubted Mr. Rossell would go to the headmaster to report an insult. If he did, during the course of the disciplinary proceedings, the actual insult I'd made would come out. Eventually, I would lose the proceedings and the faculty would punish me, but for the rest of Mr. Rossell's tenure would linger the stench of my inference. But wait, had Mr. Rossell been really been sniffing briefs when the students were at dinner? He and I had a laundry room standoff. He took my measure, calculating whether a high school student had the worldliness to understand and deploy the long-term ramifications of this insult and the threat it had conferred, which I did understand instinctively, although my show of confidence smugness wavered a little due to the fact that hypocritically, I had a nighty shoved in my pants. Get to the dining hall, Mr. Rossell said finally. I'm gonna be there in five minutes. If you're not at your seat, you can look forward to a suspension. I ate dinner with the nighty in my pants. Anytime any of the girls at my table looked at me, I had this horrible guilt that the nighty might belong to her, that with her intimate fabrics pressed, against, pressed to my crotch, I was violating her in a minor way, even as she asked me to pass the ketchup or whatever, and more, by some occult womanly power, she might sense this. Cockiness came easily with that asshole, Mr. Rossell. He and I knew the codes for each other, but with the girls at my dining table, I spent the meal blushing with my face in, the, in my plate of spaghetti and grunting monosyllables, just in case one of those girls could somehow read the guilt on my face. It was, uh, basically it was worth it. Uh, and that's probably my time to read. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, <gasps> love. I feel so like you just gave us a gift. Like you just gave us a Thank present you. by reading us a new story. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's now time to, to introduce our, our, um, our final reader tonight. Um, and that is Brontes Burnell, who I got to know just a little bit uh, during um, the reading of Tramps Like Us, the Joe Westmoreland book as part of a, a Participant Inc. event where Brontes read with Samuel Delaney and Eileen Miles and- A great and event, I love that event. All these great people. Um, so I'm gonna just say a little bit about Brontes. Um, Brontes is a writer, musician, dancer, filmmaker, and performance artist. He is the author of a graphic novel, a novella, a children's book, and the novel Since I Laid My Burden Down. A recipient of a 2018 Whiting Award for Fiction, he was named one of the 32 Black male writers of our time by T New York Times Style Magazine in 2018. Burnell is also the frontman for the band The Younger Lovers, uh, the co-founder of the experimental dance group The Brontes Burnell Dance Company, uh, the creator of the renowned cult scene Fag School. And I'm wondering, can we contribute? How do we contribute to Fag School? Um, how do we contribute to Fag School? Um, you can totally Venmo me. Here, I'll put it right here. I'm making a new one right now. Um, and But I'm kind of uh, a little behind. But if anybody wants a new one, just hit me up. And um, I can we can talk details afterwards. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Um, he's the director of, of several short films, music videos, and most recently the documentary Unstoppable Feet, Dances of Ed Mock. Uh, born in Triana, Alabama, he's lived in Oakland, California for over 18. His books are revelations. Um, I was enchanted by every page of 100 Boyfriends and Since I Laid My Burden Down. Um, the Boyfriends Shimmer Like Diamonds, Beautiful Spirits, Basking in Brontez's Gaze. And as Parul Segal said in the New York Times just the other day, um, this hurricane of delirious, lonely, lewd tales is a taxonomy and grand unified theory of the boyfriend in every tense. So please join me, and I'm gonna pin him while I do this, in, um, in, in welcoming Brontes. Hi. Thank you. Um, 
no, no problem. It's good to see y'all. Um, I'm actually not reading anything from 100 Boyfriends, but I just wanted to do in the spirit of an experiment and a disorder, or maybe it goes the other way, but I'm gonna do these two things. I'm gonna start with a poem and then I'm gonna have a short story for you. So um, this first poem has lots of titles, but I don't have one for it today. So I'll just gonna give it to you. <clears throat> of course, we should fear bad men. The gods need to eat today, said the boy who shot 16 of his classmates. And also, like every other fucking man, I too am bloody. They often tell me so. This egregious honky piece of shit that was trying to fuck my boyfriend and I was on cocaine, like being myself, you know, like how I am. And when I left the circle, he was like, is that man always so bloody? My boyfriend told me this whilst laying in bed that night. And much like counting sheep, I counted all the things that were as bloody as me. One by one, jump across the fence. I am as bloody as the Gaza Strip, Ferguson, Laura Palmer wrapped in Jeffrey Dahmer, blood diamonds, Pussy, do you need to change your sanitary napkin, as my father would say when I was being a pussy? Remy Ma versus Nicki Minaj. Azalea Banks versus literally fucking everybody. Money, Mortal Kombat, the boy that gave me HIV. Once again, I am referring to myself. That friend that publicly scandalized my name, the Blood Moon, the Manson Girls, George Zimmerman, Mariel Franco, the Iron Triangle, any American president. Roots by Alex Haley, All Eyes on me by Tupac Shakur, my mother, my father, my baby sister, my suicidal white girl roommate, a Sylvia Plath poem. I'm too tired to count sheep anymore. I insist that I am only as bloody as my memories. Was it that joke that I made about my stepfather? Is that what offended this egregious honky bastard that wanted to fuck my boyfriend? I certainly would have said something bloodier, but considering the man I offended, I become more and more uninspired. To someone as bloodless as that man, I'm certain that someone like me is as red as the contents of a packet of ketchup, though blood and ketchup are both red and both mostly made up of complex sugars um so i'm gonna hearken back to max's story because i actually have a story called saint patrick's day um as someone who is 196 irish american i um just really i don't know <laughs> felt it in my soul this past saint patrick's day um you know just thinking about my afro-celtic heritage and um this is not about that at all <clears throat> I am rolling oh, St. Patrick's Day. I am rolling around naked on a Chinese rug from the late 1800s. I'm thinking really, really hard about it because I'm on ketamine and can't telescope back any emotion for the life of me. Every shape of every thought becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and then multi-sided. I have to catch my breath when I think of like the world and its vastness and blah, blah, blah things of that nature, like China, oh my God, that's so far away. And also the late 1800s, oh my God, so far away. Just by rubbing my dick on this old ass rug, I feel like I'm sticking my entire penis and the whole space-time continuum without a rubber. This is probably how the characters on Star Trek feel all the time. My daddy is this older Asian dude. He collects boys and art. He has shit in this house that's even older than the rug. In fact, everything in his house is like a thriving specimen of a different time, his self included. He's damn near 60, but looks like a nine-year-old in the face. He's wearing a black see-through lace romper that for whatever fucking reason is paired with a big ass button that says, kiss me, I'm Irish. And I'm like, but it's not St. Patrick's Day. And he's like, no, like I'm from Vietnam, you get it? He is holding a plate of drugs and is high as fuck also. He asked this without a hint of humor or irony. And this is why I love this man. Um, my daddy is handing drugs to some guys on the couch. He is holding his annual Wednesday orgy. Doing copious amounts of drugs with other gay men is so cathartic. Gay drug brotherhoods are powerful. Every time I do hella drugs with other faggots, I feel like it erases in my brain a time a bully kicked my ass. 
I might really actually be in love with this man, but he is upset with me for two reasons. One, I can't participate in the orgy because I have chlamydia in my dick hole. I got the call from the doctor the morning of the orgy. And two, he told me a month ago that he wanted me to make him a special painting just for his collection, something he could keep from me forever. But it felt like such a call to action that I flaked on it for months. The first time he and I fucked, I was so stoned, I actually said, have you ever thought about how the word painting has the word pain in it? That's when he decided I should make him a painting for his personal collection. Part of me dreams of slaying box at this orgy, of course. This is, of course, only a dream. Even though I don't have chlamydia in my asshole, it's still a bloodborne virus. It doesn't mean I can't give it to someone out of my dick hole. My daddy is insisting I come to the couch and get fucked anyway. These sluts don't give a fuck, he insists, both out of modesty and but out of modesty and self-preservation. I stay high and solitary on the carpet. Now I need not play the prude here. I know all the nooks and crannies of the city, all the deep, dirty, dark cuts and crevices, places I can go where the boys don't care what you have. In fact, you need not talk about anything. I know places where the boys don't care how much money you make or what private college you went to. Places where the boys are so horny, they don't even give a fuck what your dick looks like. Places where a penicillin shot in your butt cheek or a lifetime regimen of pills is merely an occupational hazard. The places where I can go, not to mention a single thing about myself. I can just be a walking fuck shadow that's willing to grant any stranger who insists upon it any inch of its body full entry. That is to say, I could do this, but I'm just too fucking comfortable high as fuck on this ancient ass Chinese rug. I'm on drugs on an ancient Chinese rug right now. I send it in a group text. Oh my God, is this how Grace Jones felt in the 80s? Oh my God, is this how Grace Jones feels every day? I mean, probably. As I roll around on this ancient rug, I keep fantasizing about moonlighting as a top. Sometimes I wish I could have been like the boy in Moonlight. That movie, remember? Like the movie where he touches one dick as a teenager and spends like 20 years really, really, really wrestling with that. I think that's why that movie won an award. He didn't become the lavender menace that boys like me become the second a dick enters our life. He let that one hand job crescendo him into a specimen of masculine restraint. And honestly, I'm so fucking the old, I'm so fucking over the world rewarding pie, piety. But of course, I'm a promiscuous homosexual and no one listens to me. If it had been a movie about a boy like me, it would have suffered from lack of piety. Like there would be the scene of me touching my first dick and then another and then another and then like 900 more. And it would end with a shot of the camera panning down from a group of wind wisp leaves falling onto a tombstone, mine, that reads, she touched a lot of dicks. The movie about my sexual life, a bleak romantic comedy with super awkward and chatty orgy scenes sprinkled all through it. I don't see it winning any awards. I am curled in the fetal position and playing with my penis. It is hard and the head of it is resting on my navel and the skin around it is configured into some asymmetrical circular shape. And I am envisioning what it would look like if I were to be circumcised. I can't really picture it, but I pull back the foreskin and my dick is lacrimating from the view of my daddy fucking literally everyone and anyone on the couch. Like, is it even an orgy if it's just one top? Or is it called community work? Someone should really buy my daddy lunch for like buying all the drugs and topping. Again, I might really love this man. My daddy has absolutely zero interest in my dick. As the saying goes, that man is such a top that he doesn't even bother wiping his ass after he takes a shit. Only like, that's just a saying. This man not only is a top who owns a bidet, but he still splashes expensive French toilet water on his asshole and balls as like a whole aromatherapy trip for whoever's sucking his dick. Again, I might actually fucking love this man. 
I am not by nature an overly choosy person when it comes to lovers, but my run rule is that his skin has to be as soft and as beautiful as mine, just like my daddy's. I like the feel of another smooth body, so smooth that I can only imagine it being akin to the texture of the skin of a dolphin. Like every time I fuck another hairless man, Part of me can't help but imagine that we are having telepathic, high-pitched, squealy dolphin sex that's too high-pitched for other humans to hear, and only we can hear it in our heads, and every dog within a two-block radius is like dying from how dog whistle like our fucked up human dolphin sex sounds. We say nothing because dirty talk is for people who watch too much goddamn porn. Sex with a top of my caliber demands a charged telepathic silence. Except for the dolphin in imagery, every part of this scenario is turning me on and I jack off on the carpet alone from the for the five others on the couch having sex. I honestly don't think I've noticed any of them once. I spray the entire contents of my balls all over myself and my stomach is covered in chlamydia laced semen. And I am so relieved that I found enough ego within me somewhere to bust a nut and my mind can finally calm itself. I don't even bother to wipe myself clean. I simply sleep in it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 oh, you're so awesome Brontez all of you are so awesome thank you all so much wow so great really I feel like this is a balm on my soul and I love you all mm. thank you Brontez that was that was um that was incredible. And we're so grateful to have all the readers tonight. Thank you. And um, I, um, there's just so many images I won't get out of my head that I, I, I just loved. And I loved fo following the chat. Hey, Kristen, change your background. Um, yeah. We need to say one more time that we want to thank Dixon Place for, for hosting us tonight and um, for keeping arts alive. And we just hope that I, I would like Mike to send another uh, kind of donation, uh, you know, link in there. People feel like donating you. They feel like um, someone just wrote, I want Brontes to eat me alive. <laughs> um, so do I. So, um, and then the next thing we want to do is just give a quick shout out to our favorite independent press, The Song Cave. Um, they're doing a, um, a, um, uh, a benefit uh, where different, uh, that's my dog growling in the background. Sorry about that where different um, artists and writers have uh, donated um, photographs to uh, for sale. And I, this is mine. And, and this is mine. That's, that's Kristen's. And um, here is the, I'm gonna throw the, the link in so that you can um, go check out the other, there's a, so many great artists and photographs in the, on the website. Here it is. Um, I'm also gonna sh quickly show Brontez's. Um, yeah, show Brontez's photo. Is that okay, Brontez? Wait, yeah, what photo is it? It was the one that you donated for the auction. Oh yeah, where I'm a walrus. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, quickly go zoom preferences and then choose. Can I take a picture of y'all? Yeah. <laughs> So all the photographs are, are set only $75. They're in editions of 30 and they go to support independent publishing. Um, and um, I will hope you check it out. And yeah. um, we'll be back with another uh, another installation soon. Kristen, I, I feel like I've hogged this tail end. You talk. Absolutely not, absolutely not. I just wanna say like all of our writers and readers are here. I just wanna like give a big hug to all of you and really- Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And you know, when we're all in person, again, I hope we get to do this in person again. You know, thank you. This was so great. Um, does anybody want to have any, you know, anything anybody wants to talk about quickly at the end or any of our readers? I want to read with y'all again, DM me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. 
Yeah, you should you should take this show on the road, the four of you. I want to like produce it. I'll drive the van. Yeah. Well, I wanted to say also, I got a private message from somebody named A, but there's a lot of people named A because that's kind of how we did that. So like, you know, hit me on some other platform. I'm, I'm on the internet. <laughs> yes, buy Brontez's EP so we can dance to that music. Buy all the books. Buy all the books. Go to Song Cave, donate to Dixon Place and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so Bye, everybody. Much. Thank you for coming to Dixon Place. Thank you to our audience. Thank you, Mark.